Go Street Parking and take like 10 minutes. Oh, this is you did it just now? Well, like 20 minutes. You probably took my one spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's okay. No, it's good. I'm just using your exit reader. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, we didn't know. <laughs> just in case. Yeah, just in case. Uh, you know, Caroline did not serve booze. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. I was, I was like, like yeah. And then I was like, I'm pretty sure that Sajonza said something about wine last night, but that could just be blurry with other memories. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure we should drink it for you. <laughs> I am not sure we <laughs> should drink it for you. So this is everyone that's here. Nikki is going to join, but she's also having... So should we start? Yeah, we can start. If Do you want to start, Juana Rosa? Yeah, sure. Okay. So am I the first one? Heck yeah. Wow. <laughs> So can I can, can this be kind of like my practice? Can I get like a second round or something? It can. Well, how long is your talk? Oh, not okay. I thought you said you can't. What was that? How long is your talk? Um, I'm hoping that it's not even ten minutes. Okay. Well, in which case you have probably everybody's getting half an hour, right? Uh, Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Oh, so yeah, so you can get another chance at it. Yeah. Um. The reason is because I'm I'm kind of doing an ask for a part, you know, my MVP is an ask for participation, and so I'm I'm hoping that I can transfer this over to my Facebook page, um, and 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 have the ask there. So it intentionally has to be short. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? I'm gonna stop talking about the logistics because I had nothing to do with organizing that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yes, uh, I think Sarah has it under control. She's talking to somebody. Are those your guys' offices, one Rosa? Yes. Yep. These are ours. We're on the sixth floor, right in Echo Park. Gorgeous. Oh, beautiful. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, what? <laughs> So I the only person I can see is um Sujatha and We're coming to Pat. Pat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, no, so somebody needs to sit here. Is that? Yeah. Who's who's that on the end? Putum. Sandra. Sandra, well, you're in. Okay. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> you're already here. I was already here for a different meeting, and so right. I need to stay and, and do my ten topic person. Okay, yeah. great. All right, so uh, Sarah, I'm assuming this is like your. It's live. Okay, okay. everyone can watch it right now. Woo! All right. All right, awesome. So um, let's get started. And Sarah, the only person on online, I guess, is me, right? Yeah, Nikki was going to join, but she's going to join after, so we don't distract you. Okay. Um, all right, perfect. So I will get here a little bit closer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should step forward because you were in the light, and it was really nice. Oh, really? So I should go here? Yeah, that way. Or up. Ups forward. Yeah. Or there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, for some reason, this feels different than other pu public spe speaking events. So, just so you know, everybody that's coming next, <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be awesome. <laughs> so here we go. Um, so welcome to my to to the TED Talk. My name is Juana Rosa Cabero. 
and I'm going to talk to you today about this vision and, and this idea that I have about doing things a little bit differently than how we've been doing. I've been working in nonprofits for about um, almost 10 years now, uh, working on the side of boards and on the side of staff, and I've kind of seen a little bit of difficulties and quite honestly some of the burnout and stress that we go through in order to raise funds to do our work. And so it's with this premise that I come and speak with, to you today. Over the years, I have seen powerful resourcelessness among women of color. Among communities, women are the pillars of the communities, of our families, of our businesses, our churches, and then our community-based organizations. Yes, I do believe that women have the power to change the world, and I have seen it in the work that I do, and I have seen it among my colleagues. However, we're not always recognized in our spaces of leadership. And in order for our work to be successful, it is time that we are. The values that women, and specifically women of color, bring to organizations are that we really support the work of emerging leaders. We want to share the leadership. We have this commitment around local investments and we really believe in education. However, we understand that we don't want to do this alone. We know and understand the benefits of relationship building and the idea of building partnerships and coalitions. We know that in order to get down to business, it is important that we first get down and know each other. We have social hours, we have happy hours, and we always start an event or a meeting with at least half an hour to just chit chat, drink the coffee, or if not, make the margaritas. <laughs> these are the values that we bring, and these are the values that are also cherished within our communities. As a coordinator of a coalition for several years, I saw that we wanted to value, that we valued the immediacy of our work and that the bonds that we created really impacted our compassion and our passion to continue to do the work. We had a commitment not only to our work, but to each other. Yet doing this work in this type of environment, in the nonprofit environment, those values aren't always nurtured. The work is hard, and sometimes the funding is hard to come by. Evaluations don't always measure our compassion, our unity, our interest, and God forbid the amount of time that we spend in our work. As a board member and as a director, as a staff and several nonprofits, I know the importance of grant making, but I also know its difficulties. It's exhausting, and at times it can squash creativity, innovation, and passion. So this is what I want to do. I wanted to promote alternative funding practices that will invest in ventures that will achieve large-scale transformations. And so I'll say it again. I want to promote alternative funding practices that will invest in ventures that will achieve large-scale transformations. So what does this mean? So let's get back to our values. How is it that we pull together events? So think about an event that you're going to do with your organization. The first thing is you expand the network, right? You bring other people together. You call your friends. Um, you reach out through emails. You expand your network. You share the responsibility, right? You bring, you bring the chairs. I'll bring the drinks. You get the speaker. I'll bring the cash box. And think of this within our communities as well. So let's just think about a quinceanera. There is somebody who brings the cake, somebody who does the dress, somebody who does the tables. It's your padrino. And then long term, it's also somebody that is going to take care of that young girl throughout her life. So it's a shared responsibility. And then we root, we, we, we root the, the event in our social cause as well. And of course, like always, we have a social hour at the beginning to make sure that everybody's happy and wanting to do the work. <laughs> <laughs> These are the values that we bring. So then, 
Where can we come up with alternate funding or informal financing practices that we can glean from our traditions to support achieving this large-scale transformation? So what can we get from those simple activities such as planning a quinceanera or planning an event or a spoken word night to achieve these really large-scale transformations and hopefully also get it funded? So within the immigrant community across the globe, Women have gained access to capital outside of the traditional nonprofit formal financing institutions through micro lending, through giving circles. Promotoras are able to work along the border and around towns. Aids and education groups were able to get started just by getting people together in their living rooms and talking about what was happening. And this was in the early 70s and 80s. What's going on? DB programs start in women's living rooms. So local initiatives exist for social good, where the profit is the betterment of society. And hopefully that is going to spark more action and more transformation long term. And so I say this for two reasons. We have to change the way that we build and that we raise funds for our work. And we have to change the perception that small-scale incremental local work is ineffective to achieve large-scale transformations. And so we need to start the conversation. And I want to hopefully virtually convene a network of women of color interested in developing funds for local work. And so what would this look like? This would just be an opportunity to bring together the expertise of women, and specifically women of color, in the nonprofit sector that have already seen the difficulties to accessing funds. And can it happen? Yes, it can happen. And I want to establish a network of women that are pushing the envelope on how to make it happen. We are burning ourselves out trying to fund our work when the resources we already have in our community. We have the money, we have the time, and we have the knowledge. In philanthropy, 0.4 foundation funds go to the API community. 0.25 go to the American Indian community. Yet women give more than men, but we earn less. There are giving circles, there is identity-based philanthropy, social entrepreneurs, there are models galore. And the success stories of people that have done this exist. Native American communities in Arizona were able to pull time, money, and expertise within their traditional tribal languages from across the U.S. to find and innovate and incubate new models to engage the community. Everyday people in organized philanthropy expanded the capacity of a whole community to develop and access resources and forge access to what they needed. And remember I said, only 0.25, 0.25% of philanthropy dollars go to the American Indian community. The Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services was able in 2013 to mark $1 million in grants that they were able to give to their community-based organizations. And I use that word cautiously because not everybody was a 501c3. Additionally, they had a teen grant initiative. And this was just about getting money for teens to give money to other teens. So the models exist. The Asian American Pacific Islander in philanthropy, and I'll repeat the statistic from before, 0.4% of philanthropy goes to the API community. They were able to establish 11 giving circles in nine cities with 600 donors, and this equaled $600,000, aside from all the other research that they have done on the benefits of giving circles in, the, in communities. And in Washington, an Indian country where there is a dearth of 501c3, meaning that there is very difficult to first one establish one and also have the capacity to continue one, these communities were able to bring up $287,000 to 
just from individual donations. So it can be done, and it does happen. The work is disjointed, unfortunately. It's difficult to capture and hard to replicate. So some of the challenges, we keep reinventing the work. There's not this great cross-learning that is happening. And large sectors of our communities are still left untapped. And there's also a lack of capacity. And again, I have experienced it myself. Within the coalition that we have, it's difficult to sustain it. One, because we have a lack of capacity in order to just work through maintaining the coalition itself. So drawing on our own resources. We have the money, we have the time, and we have the knowledge. We have the combined expertise. Join me in a conversation where the expertise, where your expertise can make this happen. And remember, if money is something that scares you, our community is larger than that. It's the money, it's the time, but more importantly, it's the knowledge that makes the changes happen. And yes, we can do large-scale transformations. Yes, we can work at a local level. Yes, we can work with our neighbors, our vecinas. Yes, we can have cafecitos. Yes, we can have meetings in our living rooms that eventually will turn into entire communities making the changes that they need for themselves. The expertise is there. And what I need is a network of women that are willing to put their time and their knowledge into it to figure out how is it that we can make it happen, how is it that we can push the envelope. These meetings will be virtually conducted, hopefully in two hours' time. And of course, there will be a 30-minute free time for us to chit-chat and talk. And you can make your margarita in your living room. <laughs> so you can share it with all of us on a similar um, format. Mm -hmm. But essentially, the money, the time, and the knowledge is out there. And we can make this happen for our communities. As you can see below, there is a link to the, um, to the meeting. Please join me. How long was that? So good. No, I didn't. Um, it was like uh, 14 minutes. Yeah. Oh, wow, that was too long. OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is where editing can help, so yeah. Yeah. no worries. Nice job. Well, yeah, yeah, great job. Great. Yeah. How do you feel? Um, yeah, you know, I think, um, um, I don't know. I'm glad I, I did it. I'm glad it's over because it's stressing me out, Sujata. <laughs> <laughs> I have done legislative visits and I have not been that stressed out. So, <laughs> well, you were great, the governor. <laughs> not, my heart isn't beating as fast. So, um, yeah, I think you know it, it's that ask, and I think that's where I got more like tongue twisted around. It was that I'm asking you to participate on something that I want to do and only me wants to do it. Um, so I think that that's the kind of piece that is, um, yeah, it makes you feel vulnerable because you're like reading faces wanting to make sure that, you know, do you maybe want to do it too? Or, you know, it's kind of like a first date or something. And, you know, <laughs> you going to kiss me or no? Should I change the subject? So, some of, yeah, that's I think where my, my anxiety was coming around. So. You were great. Yeah, you yeah. were really great. You did a very nice job of managing it, and uh, you really came across well. So thank you. Thank you for being the first one to do it. Yeah. yeah. Guess I shouldn't move too much. <laughs> so um, is Juana Rosa going to stay on when Nikki is Nikki going next, or Nikki is not going next. I'm not okay. Going next. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm down to know. And then Nikki, right? Yeah. And then Nikki. Yeah. And then Nikki. And then Nikki. And then Nikki. And then Nikki. I think it's like you and Nikki. I don't know. Let me get you a. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. That was fun. I love her energy. I was like, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I was like, I want a margarita. <laughs> Everybody drink. Uh, I 
<laughs> it's fun to see how much your projects change, Juan Rosa. Yeah, it has. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm really into kind of this idea around um, yeah, giving circles. Uh huh. But um, I don't want to just um, jump into just the giving circles because there are so many other models. Uh huh. And so I would like to, you know, hear what other folks want to do around that and then just make it small. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I'm looking. People give like $250, $300 to like small, small things and it can grow into something bigger. But Yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of the nice thing with the MVP, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to like think like, oh, it's got to be figured out right away, but right. start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I figured that my MVP can be that, just that convening of what is it or how this would look, uh -huh. and then, um, you know, turn it into an actual, but also there's so many strings attached to giving circles. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it gets complicated. Yeah, that, that's, that's why um, initially when I talked to Monique, I was like, well, I just want to go ahead and start a giving circle, uh -huh. but yeah. It's yeah. like another nonprofit in a way. Yeah. And do you know Peggy Saika at APIP, the Asian Pacific Islanders in Philanthropy? No. Um, who was it that was that's connecting me? Is um, oh my gosh, she's in our. She's one of the sparklers who works at the Ford Foundation. Oh, Ellen Liu. Yeah. Ellen Liu. Hi. Yeah. But yeah. do you know somebody at APIP because they have a lot of the research? Yeah, and I also actually know Peggy. So. Okay. Yeah, you would yeah. love. Sorry, if you I know. Go to Google Plus. Um, if you hit. Like, Sarah's Google. trying to talk to somebody too. Um, but yeah, and it does it not Peggy's so really right. great because she really came up through grassroots organizing. Okay. Um, and she's like helped start a bunch of organizations, but it's really like she developed APIP really out of that sense of like our communities need to be coming together and funding the most interesting work in our communities, and so she's really done a phenomenal job of building that out. And you know, she's done it over the years, so I'm sure she could also like, yeah, you know, share ideas in terms of what works and what's challenging, and okay, even how she just got it started. Because exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So especially if she's been doing it for a couple of years. I, I've seen some of the research is that Kellogg is funded a lot of this. Yeah, and do you know Raquel Donoso? Yeah, I let yeah. So she's yeah, and they have a Latina circle. Yes, yeah. Um, which which kind of is what got me away from just doing a Latina one because there's quite a bit of Latina giving circles. Oh, okay, interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, interesting to think about, like you know, as women of color, like you know, what are the like what are the points of connection, and then what are the tensions, right? Because I just out back to Sister Song and the challenge they've had as like a multiracial organization. So I mean, a great space for learning. <laughs> Yeah. Well, congratulations. Great idea. Thank you. Love it. Love it. All right. I think uh, Nikki's ready here. Oh, well, I do. Um. I take my stuff. She could take my stuff, and then she. Um. I'll tell you what. Yeah. I think uh, Sarah. Well, so it's on air, so it's like a YouTube so, thing. So Sarah's trying to get Nikki on, so she can be watching Chanel. Okay. No more wine for me. Yes, I have some wine. I'm going to wait. Here, I'm going to invite you one more time. See if it shows up anyway. Oh, yeah. So it should be like on your face. Like nine minutes and forty seconds, which means I'm going. To <laughs> I'm happy to do the time. Maybe if uh, you guys want that. Oh no. no. Okay. All right. Yeah. We, we were talking there, about this too. I think fingers will scare us. Okay. No, I wasn't going to like. I wasn't going to prompt you in terms of time. Oh, just at the end. end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I found out that we have a comment. Yeah, these are your main types of You might, did you add me on, like, am I in one of your circles? Yeah. 
just hilarious. I've done a million Google Hangouts before, and the one that actually matters, I can't seem to get on. Do you want to go first? Like, are you under time constraints? Um, I have to I have to get off at 9.30, but no, that's an hour from now, so I don't have to go now. Okay. I'm sorry to screw up the flow. Okay. Yeah. No, we didn't. Hi, girl. Hi. Hi. Juana Rosa, I heard yours too, and it was amazing. I was oh, listening. You just couldn't see me. Oh, yay. Yeah, it was great. Girl. Look awesome. Thank you. Hey. Uh, <laughs> I like that you look so my voice to create visibility for the social justice issues that matter to me and to the people around me. And I've leveraged my extroversion to engage people in taking action on you know, creating social change and, uh, and giving money. But I'm not here to take your money today. <laughs> today I'm here to talk to you about Digivolve. Digivolve is a communications firm that is committed to bridging the gap to access to strategic communications and visibility tools for organizations creating social change, specifically those organizations who are working with women and people of color, and that are led by women and people of color. Digivolve is unique because we work from a communications coaching model um, with the community. And and for the organizations that we partner with, um, all of our services are free. When I was in college, I organized several protests um, to engage the university administration in taking action on issues that matter to me. By the third protest, the university administrator, the vice provost, who was an African-American woman who spoke with authority but compassion, told me that I should harness my enthusiasm. Right? <laughs> I was furious <laughs> and frustrated at what I perceived to be as a lack of concern. But what I later took away from that was that the strategies and tactics that I was using to reach my goal weren't working, and that I needed to reassess, and that there wasn't just one way to get to where I needed to go. The Digivolve curates carefully crafted curriculum <laughs> um, for each that we partner with. Visibility is defined as the ability to see and be seen. And as somebody who's worked in journalism and strategic communication for the last eight years, there are two things, two concepts about visibility that are very clear to me. An organization who can create more visibility for themselves, an organization who works for social change, who can create more visibility for themselves, has access to more opportunity. Larger, well-resourced organizations have more opportunity because they can create more visibility. And conversely, smaller, less resourced organizations have less visibility and therefore less opportunity. 
the kinds of opportunity that we're talking about here are increased revenue streams, um, amplified volunteer base, but most importantly, a sustainable and successful way to communicate with the people who care about the issues that they're talking about. Here's the obstacle. Some years ago, foundations who fund nonprofit organizations started giving money for communication support. This is in large part due to social and alternative media, which have revolutionized the way that we exchange information. And that's what communications is, right? It's the exchange of information. Prior to this, larger well-resourced organizations could simply hire public relations firms to do their communications for them and leverage their work, something small organizations could never do. So while there's more money being invested in communications, it's not necessarily being allocated across the board to all nonprofits, but only to some. So what this does is it creates an undue burden for smaller, less resourced nonprofits to compete with larger, well-resourced nonprofits for the same visibility. Okay? But before I talk to you about the solution, I'm, I think it's important to tell you how did Duvall chooses the staff, staff that it works with. Because we work from a community coaching model, we prioritize hiring communications coaches to work with our organizations, with the organizations that we partner with, who are from the communities that we serve. These coaches receive extensive training and support throughout their tenure, and the strategists that coach them come from a breadth of experiences and um, in both nonprofit and for-profit. So in order to bridge the gap, the access gap to strategic communications and visibility tools, we employ a four-part methodology. But this methodology um, emphasizes evaluation and efficiency. So the first part of that methodology is to employ, uh, um, excuse me, to, to curate a um, well-crafted curriculum for each organization. I like to call this curriculum adding. Audit, develop, implement, and evaluate. So when we start working with an organization, we audit the communications they're using, if any. And we, this basically tells us what's working and what's not working and in which areas they need improvement. This also helps us determine how to tell the organization to be more strategic, to get the most out of their investments, and to develop a plan, which is the D in Addy. We develop a plan that is specifically meant to meet that organization's needs. Because we know that there's no one size fits all, we really want to work with the organization on their priorities. Now the implement and evaluate parts actually go hand in hand. So because we prioritize efficiency, on a weekly basis, we, we do the evaluation and the coach brings back a report to the strategist, so for example, me, and we assess what's working and what's not working, and then we re-implement it that same week or the following week, right? We don't waste any time. Efficiency means taking best practices that are based on Digivolve's experience and the organization's needs and implementing them on a weekly basis. The second part of that methodology is working from a data-driven model. So, Almost every form of communications can be tested. Thanks to a breadth of evaluation tools, communications reach is no longer a science. I mean, no, it's no longer a guess, it's now a science. It's almost math, right? Thirdly, we like to cultivate institutional memory within organizations. So an occurrence that happens within nonprofits and for-profits alike is that many organizations have one person who knows, who understands how to implement and evaluate their communications. When that person leaves, that information leaves with them. Super unsustainable. So essentially what we require for an organization who's gonna partner with us is for them to commit at least two or more staff members to be able to understand and learn the model. But because we know that efficiency, I mean, excuse me, capacity is largely an issue for these organizations, they're not required to implement it on a day-to-day -day basis. Simply step in when that person steps out for any reason. And lastly, we really want to work from an organization's strengths and so we work with the organization who has already determined their organizational priorities to make sure that we are giving them the best strategy possible. Digivolve is committed to bridging the gap of access to strategic communications and visibility tools for nonprofits that are creating social change that are led by women and people of color. We know that together we can create equal access for everybody. Thank you. Yay. Yeah. 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 That was awesome. So what 
was talking about that didn't feel like that would be the impression that I experienced by people. Just like a back end conversation and not more of a sound. Even though I feel like a little bit of like a, an asshole for not including it. But I don't know. And that can be Light that's behind you kind of overpowering. Oh, sure. I can move myself actually. Sorry, I don't have a, a very efficient setup for really nice film shooting in my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Better for you? Way better. Great. Okay. Um, should I just start or what? what's the scoop? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's ready. All right, when you are. Okay, cool. Um, well, and oh, and I can see Juana Rosa too. She's very tiny, um, but good. I, I'm asking because um, my talk, because it um, surrounds a participatory theater workbook, um, begins with a participatory activity. <laughs> so I just actually need to be able to see you all. And this is the first time I've ever led anything participatory virtually, so I'm very excited to see how it goes. Um, so it's just a really simple kind of brief polling activity that we'll build on and scaffold throughout the talk. Um, so I was hoping to start with something really simple, which is just a very um, brief geographic poll. So um, in a minute, actually, instead of raising your hands like you sometimes do for polls like these, we'll take Coraline's kind of famous finger wag. Yeah, just like that. Um, and you'll do it if the statement is true for you. So um, give me a little finger wag or wave um, if you are originally from the West Coast. Originally. OK, great. How about East Coast? Great. Um, somewhere in the South? American South, great. Midwest? Holler. Okay, great. Somewhere I didn't name. Okay, great. <laughs> um, how about uh, how about give me a little finger wave if you had any kind of sex ed in middle school or high school? Awesome. Okay, that's everybody. So we don't have to do the opposite. How about a finger wag if that sex ed was abstinence only? So it didn't present any other options besides abstinence. Great. Okay. Uh, how about a finger wag if it had some kind of comprehensive information presented? <laughs> We're not so sure what comprehensive means. Okay, great. Um, and that, now a finger wag if um, your sexuality education experience was a generally positive one. If you look back and think, yeah, that was pretty positive for me, good times. Okay. Finger wag, <laughs> finger wag if it was a generally um, negative or awkward experience. Okay, and hands down. And then lastly, just uh, finger wag if you don't really remember or, yeah, right, or it's not. <laughs> Great. Um, so then the last part of this is just if you can think of one word that uh, describes your experience of sexuality education in high school or middle school. Now bring that word to the front of your head. And on the count of three, we'll say our words out loud together. Okay? And you'll come back to them in a minute. Does everybody have a word? 
Okay, great. And we'll share them together on one, two, three. Nice. Okay, so do hold on to that word and hold on to the story that you think is attached to that word. So maybe a moment, a critical experience that you had of engaging with sexuality education when you were younger. Um, because for me, the, the word that I would use to describe that experience was, uh, was shame. And it was the experience of feeling shamed uh, both in sexuality education classrooms in high school and then in any sex ed I received in our culture at large that took me to become both a, a sex educator and a theater artist um, over the past few years. And while those two things may not seem like they fit so well together, theater and sex, I've spent the past few years really thinking through um, how they complement and uh, kind of belong together perfectly. Um, so just some super quick background. My first job out of college was uh, with an organization called the Chicago Girls Coalition. And I was sort of thrown into youth work um, for, uh, it was a young women's leadership and development program that basically chose their own curriculum each year. And the first uh, three to four weeks of me working with these young women, I quickly understood that uh, the curriculum that they wanted to learn about was sexual health, and that everything they wanted to teach their peers about after they learned it themselves was related to sexual health. Um, at that same time, I realized I didn't have a set of skills or tools to teach sex ed because there's a whole kind of um, bag of trauma responsiveness tools and also just sexual health information that I didn't have. But what I did have at that time was a, a set of theater tools. So I had already been making theater, I had been writing plays up until that point, and I realized, okay, well what if I used those tools to create space for young women to share their ideas, experiences, and questions about sexual health, which is what we started doing. Um, so I, I worked with a couple of other theater artists to create some what we call devising theater workshops, which just means creating new plays from the ground up. And around this time, um, the young women were also participating in a comprehensive sex ed program where I saw them regularly sort of checking out, falling asleep, um, and feeling silenced in those spaces. So they're, they're kind of in this evidence-based intervention program at the same time that we're running these theater programs that I'm watching them engage in much higher levels and ask questions that they're not able to ask in this other space. And I think, okay, so not only is there a play in this because there's lots of stories worth gathering, but the play should also mirror the kind of participation that we were using in the actual workshops, meaning that the play should be participatory, not the kind of thing that you just see in theaters that asks you to uh, sit down, shut up, and, and listen, but the kind of play that says, what is a story that you want to tell, and how can we help you tell it right now in the moment um, with the actors that we brought into the room. So all that said, that um, set of kind of creative activities and um, playmaking models became the basis for um, an organization that I worked with, that same group of theater artists to found called For Youth Inquiry, um, that I have recently been creating this workbook in collaboration with. Um, so my project is a participatory theater and community health workbook that documents the set of activities that uh, we use both to create our plays and that we use to help people in all kinds of different communities, not just young people experiencing sexuality education, but really um, uh, people of all ages who are having a hard time with otherwise stilted or silenced conversations. Um, and the way that we do that is through what... Um, I actually, through the Coraline Fellowship, really nailed down uh, as calling the four P's. So there's um, participatory activities that provide pleasure. So really, again, the idea that it, talking about sex, our bodies, and our health should be fun in some ways, in, in some critical ways it should be fun, and that, um, and that providing pleasure is a really essential function of the theater itself. Um, that they provide low-risk opportunities to pretend so that 
young people, when they're <clears throat> able to say that this story isn't about me or this isn't my question, but I'm playing a character, they're somehow able to ask their most real questions um, that they otherwise would feel embarrassed to ask. Um, so there's also the opportunity to practice, which is the third P. Um, and this one, I think, is particularly resonant in communities of adults, too. So many of us who fear intensely um, failing in front of others um, or um, fear you know, uh, saying the wrong thing in a conversation or not interrupting an oppressive moment in the right way. Participatory theater provides the opportunity to practice in safe spaces and to screw up in front of each other and to brainstorm and, and move forward from there. And then lastly, and this is what I think is particularly unique about participatory theater and not just theater in general, um, is that it provides opportunities to experience power differently than we experience it in the real world. Meaning that um, facilitators and performers and makers of participatory theater are on the same level as their audience. Literally, they do not succeed unless their audience is a part of making the event. Um, so that kind of shared power and shared art making responsibility is really different than the way that lots of programs approach um, youth development work and I think really differently than um, people who come in from outside communities often approach the work that they do within communities. Um, so those four P's ha have been woven into the very um, initial de design of a workbook that now is actually reading like a game. So I've created a, a set of activities that are game cards and they're coded in different ways so that the individual who's using them can arrange them um, to create their own curriculum design in a mechanical way that actually feels like playing a game. Um, this is a major breakthrough <laughs> that I sort of just landed on a couple of weeks ago, um, and I'm really excited to, um, to share it in, over the next few months. Um, so the last bit of my talk here before I wrap up is just to ask you to reconsider that first word that um, you use to describe your experience with sexuality education. So to pull it back to the front of your brain, and to remember the story or experience that's attached to that word and then to just consider now for a moment how that word or story might change if it was infused with pleasure, with pretend, opportunities to practice and to experience power in a different way. Um, because for me, hopefully even outside the sexuality education world, um, those, those four elements and ideas just feel so fundamental to our reproductive decision-making processes and to our growth as people with bodies. <laughs> um, and so I hope that they will really influence um, the work of practitioners across the reproductive justice movement. And that's all. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. Love the four Bs. Love the interactive version. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be so much more if we were all together. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm interested in that game. Yeah. That would be awesome to see it. Yeah. Well, so Joppa, if you get us together for another retreat, we could play the game. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> You know, maybe your uh, uh, sort of funding giving circle might figure out how to respond to it. Oh! Okay, okay, I can play, I can play. <laughs> so good, Nikki. How do you feel? I feel great. I feel really good. Yeah, I just, it's funny because I'm doing this project for school too. I, I literally presented this last night for a final for a class. <laughs> so it's much more fun to present it to you all than to a class of colleagues who seem very, very confused what I'm talking about. Oh, <laughs> really? Boo them. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun. Clear. Yeah. Very clear. Yeah. Mm. Nice thanks. Work. Cool. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I'm gonna have to head off. It was great to see everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye
Are you going to stay for a little bit? Yeah, definitely. to constantly tote around one of those old school camcorders. You know, the one that's like roughly the size of a refrigerator. You hold it on your shoulder and it looks very similar to the professional legitimate ones that they use on TV. Not in its sophistication, mind you, but in just its size and habit. <laughs> so, very different than the flip cams of today. Anyway, he was really into uh, interviewing us on random Saturdays when we were, you know, playing fetch with the dog, swinging on the swings. Um, and interviewing us as though we were talking to a family member, a faraway family member on the other side. Super riveting stuff for great grandma Mao, I imagine. <laughs> and I was watching one a couple years ago, and who I am today is so obvious to me in that little five year old in the video that I was watching. So I was chatting with dad about something or other, whatever five year olds talk about, and my littlest sister comes up to me, uh, whining about how she doesn't have enough water in, a, in her jar that she's been toting around. Um, serious, serious two year old problems. <laughs> so, without missing a beat, still yakking away to whatever phantom family member on the other side of the camcorder who was no doubt never going to see this, <laughs> I grabbed her jar, went over to the fence, got a big jug of water, poured more water into it, screwed the top back on. Handed it back to her, patted her on her head, and sort of sent her on. <laughs> and while it may not, it happened maybe like two or three more times in about ten minutes. And while that may not seem like much of an aha moment, to me it so clearly indicates my role in our family. I am the oldest of three girls, and that's a role I took very, very seriously as far back as I can remember. And I also remember years later being very uh, touched and feeling tremendous pride when my parents took me aside and they dropped me off at college and said thank you for helping to raise your sisters. But when I think about it even more, I recognize that I never chose to use those qualities and lead uh, as a visible leader. I always like to do those kinds of things behind the scenes. Much better to let someone else fail um, than to actually be the one who's failing publicly. I became a Coraline Fellow in 2013, about a year into my uh, time as Executive Director at Law Students for Reproductive Justice. And when I originally started, I wanted my project uh, to come about from some conversations that I had had in a lot of movement spaces lately about how we just don't really know about or have learned a whole lot about what other socially progressive movements are doing. So what would the housing justice community say, for example, about a particular piece of legislation? How would they share their successes? Um, what would immigrants' rights say about a success that they had or a challenge they had and the lessons they learned along the way? And you can extrapolate that to disability rights, criminal justice, environmental justice, racial justice, so many different progressive movements, yet we as a reproductive health rights justice movement still remain relatively siloed. So I thought it could be useful to the longevity and strength of all socially progressive movements to create what I was calling a visiting activist program, wherein social justice leaders from one particular movement would take leave uh, of their home organizations, for lack of a better word, uh, for six months to a year, and then go 
become a visiting activist at another organization in another movement, um, learning best practices, learning about that movement's history and how that organization plays within that movement. Um, and then what they would do is bring back all of those lessons learned to create more meaningful cross-movement collaboration and network building. So the more I talked about it, the more excited people got, and the more freaked out I got <laughs> and overwhelmed with the whole prospect. Now seems a good time to share that I'm a lawyer, <laughs> which means that I'm about as type A as you can get. And when you couple that with the older, oldest sibling overachiever characteristics that I have in spades, and you have a recipe for someone who just does not like to fail and who needs to have everything lined up in order. The first time I ever even became a visible leader was the end of my first year of law school when I ran to be president of our Public Interest Law Foundation, which is an organization dedicated to public interest and social justice lawyering. And I don't really know why I went for it, um, but I did. I never tended to go for roles like chair and president. Much, much better to let someone else fall on her face and go, what? I had nothing to do with that colossal failure. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Even if I was still a part of it, at least if I was behind the scenes, no one actually had to know it. So as this person with a wee bit of type A, I feel very comfortable, and I like having a lot of plans ahead of me. And then I like to have 40 contingency plans behind that. Should any of those ducks in a row that I have like wander off or die or just <laughs> move away from the group, I have plans. And those plans make me feel good. And so when I started to get really overwhelmed at the breadth of this project, I went to my comfortable place, which is research. And I thought that in order to have the perfect project and in order to be ready for any possible question that could come along, I would need to, at a minimum, research every socially progressive movement in the history of the world. I would need to map their trajectory from conception to the present. I would need to identify all of their successes and failures, how they interacted with each other, and ID all of the movement leaders and everything. <laughs> By myself, in less than six months, with a full-time job. <laughs> because if I did it, then I would not be ready for any possible answer that could come my way. And I would look immediately like I had no idea what I was talking about, and folks would shut me off. And that authority that I may have walked in the room with would go away in a second. So I would go into an internet black hole of clicking and researching organization after organization and printing. It was not very environmentally friendly. Printing <laughs> report after report on social movement theories and just get more and more frustrated and a little bit angry, if I'm being honest. So I was very, very fortunate in my time as a fellow to have three other fellows who lived in the same city as I did. And we decided pretty early on that we would meet uh, about every three weeks or so to kind of walk each other through this process to talk about our projects, what we were learning, support each other, how we needed to be supported, and mostly, I think, above all, to drink a lot of wine and have a lot of good food. <laughs> so it was about probably the third or fourth meeting, dinner, where I finally named what I had been feeling for so long and sort of thinking a lot, and that was, I don't want to do this. I'm over it. I can't do it. And who do I think I am that I can just convene a bunch of social justice leaders to leave their jobs for six months to a year all for the greater good without having any sort of real answers as to what they could possibly do with it. Around the same time, conveniently, I had gotten really interested in everyone else's projects. Because they were great projects, to be sure, but also because it's a hell of a lot more fun to focus on someone else's project than it was to focus inwardly on mine. And because my project was just a piece of crap and didn't deserve to be done anyway, so I might as well focus my energy and what I was good at at other people's projects. A little bit like that older sibling person I was talking about, where it feels good to play you know, peacemaker and the person with the answers to everyone else. Uh, because if they failed, it was on them. I could give them hugs from the sidelines. But if and when they failed, it would they would be the ones who looked like they didn't get things right. So why this tremendous, tremendous need to be right? Where is this fear of failure coming from? I think for me, it stemmed really from a regression back to that sort of dark, scary time in my life where I didn't know who I was. 
where my self-awareness meant that I wasn't sure about my decisions and how I walked in the world and, and how I interacted with it. So in 2009, I started blogging about my uh, journey with fat activism. I realized that I was done living and looking like and acting in such a way that society said was the way that you're supposed to. So what I did is use writing. I, through my writing, I started to really push back against the word should. As a fat person, I should never wear stripes. I should never feel sexy. I should always apologize for taking up more than my fair share of space. And every day I practiced stopping myself from thinking horrible things about how I looked and what I was wearing. Every day I sought out positive fat spaces. And every day I practiced appreciating myself and my body. And this shit was hard. It was so hard. And it changed my life. Because I went from that place to not apologizing for eating food. And I went from that place to appreciating what my body does for me and what it looks like and all the wonderful things about it. And so you may wonder, what does this actually have to do with my project? <laughs> I think that when you are able to embrace who you are, and I mean that in a broad sense, sure, but in, in a very concrete sense as, as well, who you are, the decisions you make, your moral compass, what makes you tick, when you're able to embrace those things and really start to ignore that little voice in your head that goes, but you should look like this, you should be acting like this, because that's what everyone else thinks. When you're able to do that, it's so freeing. So those little phrases about what you should be doing, I should go for a run so I deserve to have this pizza. I should work really hard on this project and it should be the most amazing project that ever existed and it should blow everyone's mind and it should be done the fastest and the best. <laughs> and basically, what you stop doing is shooting for everyone else and just focusing on embracing and celebrating what it means to do you. Sounds very easy when I say it now, but it was a you know, multi-year process to be very, very clear about things. So it was that fat activism, some intense therapy here and there in my past, reading more and more about uh, Brene Brown's research on shame and vulnerability, and Coraline's own programs that focus on uh, leaning into that discomfort and practicing a bias to action, just go for it. All of those things were with me in the room when I told my cohort of fellows that I didn't want to do this. Uh, to be clear, it came out much poutier than that, <laughs> and much angrier than that. It was crossed arms. It was, this fellowship was stupid and I hate it. <laughs> do they, is this whole thing designed for us to fail? Do they want us to fail? <laughs> is it a bigger piece of some weird experiment <laughs> that they're going to write papers on? <laughs> Essentially, it was just me pouting. But I needed to do it. I really needed to pout. And then what I also felt I needed to do at the time was turn to everyone else's project because I could help them and because I was good at it. And when you're in that dark, scary time, you want to go immediately to a place that feels good and safe. And that's what felt good and safe. So, but to say I don't want to do this or even worse, I can't do this to folks who I admire very much, it was this, it was terrifying. It was terrifying because it meant, will I lose my authority? What will people say because I'm supposed to be the activist and the lawyer and the friend who always does exactly what she says she will do and you can lean on through all times. So if I can't do what I said I'm going to do, what does that mean? After that dinner, I didn't touch my project for about a month. I really needed to sit in that like uncomfortable, angry place. I needed to think about why I was having that reaction in the first place and ultimately to move past it. And I'm glad I did take the time. And a little bit after that respite, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in a long time, and it was through our conversation that I started to really like pick a piece and hone in on a piece of the project that felt really good. And my project started taking on sort of a 2.0, and I got excited. But it's important to note that I didn't get excited because I thought that this smaller piece would ensure its success. I got excited because I recognized that when you focus on that smaller piece, it's okay to make changes, and it's okay to correct course, and it's okay to throw whole things out the window and still focus on yourself throughout the process. So this is all a work in progress, as is everything in life. And while I've done some really deep intentional thinking and work around my own self-awareness as to the decisions I make and how I move throughout the world, 
it's so easy for us to slide back into that dark, scary place, let's be honest, right? When we get triggered, and we can get triggered in all sorts of ways, you go from that sort of grounded, safe, I feel good space to that scary, scary place very quickly. So my awesome, grounded, enlightened self who can see all the beauty and the messy goes very quickly to that, oh my god, this project has to be perfect and everything has to be right, and you have to know every single answer to every single question <laughs> that could ever come up forever and ever, amen, place. Very quickly you get there. <laughs> but when you can take a breath, and I did a lot of reflection, and after reflection on my full time in the fellowship, I realized so clearly that this process was about the process. It was about the journey, it wasn't about the end product, but how I interacted with the process along the way. How did I work through my fear of failure? How did I f work through feeling like I would look dumb if I didn't have the right answer, if I didn't know absolutely everything? And most importantly, was I kind to myself in recognizing that when you can focus on learning throughout the process, not just sort of coming up with that perfect deliverable that you said you would do on day one, so it must happen on month six, you can start to just calm down a little bit and take some breaths. And while my project is a work in progress, I think it, the most important thing that I have taken away is that I don't interact with it as that type A overachieving oldest sibling person that I did at the beginning, but as someone who, on my best days anyway, can really interact with it in a way that acknowledges the beauty and possibility for innovation in the messy parts. Because those are the parts where you learn to adapt, where you reach out, where you start to change things or see a possible solution that you maybe didn't before, and above all else, where you reach out for help. Because as it turns out, as much as I love supporting people in their work, they love supporting me. Yay! <laughs> Transition, the, yeah. the, like the, especially the fat activism Yes. Yeah. Thank you. But I was like, I mean, like, I knew why it was in there, but then I was yeah. like, because it takes just like not even looking at it for like 12 hours and you come back and like, that makes no sense. It's <laughs> 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 one for me to be, or it makes sense in my head, but right. I don't want anyone else. Yeah. You've got all the other stuff in there. Yeah. Totally. How do you feel? Great. Yay! 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 <laughs> That was amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So great. Shame, vulnerability. I know. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming in mind too. So get ready. More <laughs> 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 shame all over this. More place. shame. Great. <laughs> I should get some. The fellowship should be called Shameless. Stepping away from my computer for two seconds, but I'm listening. I'm here, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Nikki. I'm really glad. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Oh, dear. Oh, damn it. So smart. Type <laughs> okay. A. Super. I'm going to start it. Okay. So I've been trying to think about how I want to talk about my Coraline Generative Fellows experience. And I've decided to share with you a story that I think will give you a pretty good sense of how I got here. Nearly 10 years ago, my then 10-year-old brother was in eighth grade. 
And our New Jersey public school used that year to do some pretty intensive comprehensive sex ed. Um, and so my brother brought home this permission slip, and he'd asked my parents to sign it. And on the permission slip was all of this information about the, the topics that were going to be covered, and asking each parent to sort of engage in conversation with their kids about these issues. So my brother hands it to my mom, who immediately hands it back. He's like, you go talk to your dad about that. <laughs> um, and so then he hands it to my dad. And my dad sort of scans the list very quickly and silently and then looks up at him and is like, uh, you know about all of this, right? And my, dad, <laughs> my brother goes, yup. <laughs> and then my dad quickly signs the permission slip and hands it back to him. And that was the closest my brother got to having the talk. Um, and I share this story because it's funny, um, but it also really captures what it was like in my home. Um, growing up, we just didn't talk about sex or bodies or pregnancy or any of that stuff. Um, and I know I'm not the only one with that story. It's probably awkward for all of you, right? Um, so having the talk was just something that my parents and I just actively avoided. It was just too uncomfortable for all of us. I mean, I just told you a story about my brother because I don't even have any funny stories to tell about my experience trying to talk to my parents about sex. <laughs> like um, and so on top of that, for a lot of Indian households, it's just not really proper to talk about these things. So my parents weren't actively trying to keep that information away from us, but they really felt that they weren't the people to talk about it. Um, and on top of that, it really seemed in a lot of ways like they were trying to protect us, keep us children for as long as they possibly could. And so when I think about it, I recognize that it comes from a place of love. Um, that said, of course, like you would expect, the thing that I wasn't supposed to talk about or know about was exactly what I wanted to know. Um, and so that meant that I was going to some you know, questionably accurate pre-internet sources for my information, <laughs> which meant that I was looking at movies and TV and novels and my equally clueless friends. Um, and so um, I was trying to get all the information that I could, uh, but in this learning process, I was really wary of sharing my own experience. Um, I didn't want people to know how much I didn't know. And so I just heard their stories and I heard their information and I just took it all in. So um, this was also sort of a trend that followed me through college as well. I went to an all-women's institution, um, so I really felt like I was supposed to know things about myself. But I was really embarrassed that I didn't. Um, and so my cover for that was that I engaged really heavily in research. <laughs> Anything that I wanted to know about, about bodies and sex and pregnancy, I majored in. Um, and so <laughs> under, under the guise of this like intellectual inquiry, I learned about my body, about sex, about relationships, about intimacy. Um, and I, I learned in that process that knowledge wasn't enough. I needed also to have some safe, supportive spaces to be able to have honest conversations about these issues and to get the support that I needed to make decisions that felt right for me about issues that were really taboo. Um, and so slowly and tentatively, um, armed with more knowledge and um, with the support of some pretty loving friends, um, I was able to join the discussions myself and to begin to share my own experiences and perspectives. Um, and I began, finally, in these spaces to really like what I learned and like these spaces for their ability um, to connect me to other people. Um, so I am, by nature, uh, just the kind of person who likes to be emotionally connected to others. Um, I'm now a public health social worker, so I've let that desire really move me professionally as well. Uh, but six years ago, after I left my lovely college bubble of support and empowerment, I was stuck in a job that really wasn't going anywhere. I was doing health policy research, but it was health policy that just didn't feel meaningful to me. Um, and there was no connection to anyone. And so having a crappy job, I think, just fills everything with like really existential feelings. You know, I felt like I was moving through this black and white haze of a French film. You know, like, what is my life and nothing matters. <laughs> um, and one night in the midst of all this ennui, I was having dinner with a friend who sort of casually mentioned that a friend of hers had just become an abortion doula. Um, and when she explained what that was, I like, I felt for the first time in months this bright little light of sunshine, um, or maybe a red balloon, or I don't know how it was. <laughs> but I found full spectrum and abortion doula work through the Doula Project in New York, um, and I had a moment where I felt like my professional and my personal lives totally just crystallized. Um, it was providing doula support to people across pregnancy decisions, so that's what I wanted to do. That's what I realized. Uh, because my friends had to have abortions, and um, sometimes they have feelings about them. 
and I had friends who had had babies, but not a lot of parenting support because they were young. Um, other friends had experienced miscarriages, and there was no one to talk to about that emotional or physical pain. Um, and then others that were considering adoption when they were pregnant, but had no idea what birth parent support felt like. Um, and so for me, for my loved ones, and for the loved ones of a lot of people I know, you know, people experienced sex and pregnancy. That was just a thing that was happening. Um, and they watched and felt their pregnancy experiences become siloed from one another. Um, and some of them were shamed, and others of them were just ignored. Um, so being a lay person who could you know, bring compassion and respect to people as they move through these big like, transitions around sex and pregnancy, that felt like it made so much sense to me. It felt so right. Um, and doing it from a place that really acknowledged people's resilience and remained sex positive, to me, that felt like revolution. Um, so I became a full spectrum doula. Um, and I eventually moved out to the Bay Area for graduate school. And, and I became the leader of the Bay Area Doula Project. Um, and when I moved to the Bay and started connecting with other reproductive justice organizations, I kept thinking to myself, full spectrum doula work is totally reproductive justice in action. You know, it's about meeting people where they are, it's about advocating for all people to have respect and compassion during their experiences. It's really about like, recognizing and reducing stigma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I just kept finding that people didn't see the work that way. This work that mattered so much to me and felt like totally in line with RJ values was just not seen as something that even fit under the RJ umbrella. Um, and so I couldn't figure it out. I thought, you know, maybe it's because abortion doula is a new term or full spectrum doula is a new term. Um, or maybe it's that the organizations that are doing this work are run by young folks um, and not funded. Um, but whatever it was, I couldn't figure it out. And so when I found the Coraline Fellowship last year, I didn't talk about doulas. I thought that the dual part of my identity would not necessarily be valued here. Um, instead, I talked about reproductive stigma in this very broad sense. And I thought that I was going to try to find interdisciplinary, intersectional strategies um, to reduce it, to reduce all reproductive stigma. Uh, so I had this plan that I was going to bring together activists and researchers and service providers. We we're just going to bring everyone together, and we were going to reduce all reproductive stigma for every single person in six months by myself. You know? <laughs> that was what was going to happen. And of course, when it came right down to it, it wasn't the right project for me. Um, for one thing, the work was already being done, and so and in so much more manageable pieces. So um, these various groups have partnered together and had already started tackling these issues. So thinking that I was the person to go in there and and just like work on stigma reduction was this huge and misguided assumption. And at the end of the day, when I sat down and I thought about it, my relationship to stigma. Um, was totally built on the work that I had done as a full-spectrum doula. That was what brought me to RJ, it was what brought me to the Bay Area, and definitely what brought me to Coraline. Um, so thanks to the love and encouragement of my fellow Oakland-based fellows, um, when I finally decided to go back to the design phase of my project, um, or just scrap it and restart it as, as it ended up being, <laughs> um, I decided to be really honest with myself and with the folks at Coraline um, about the movement-level project that I actually wanted to work on. Um, and so, as the co-director of this full spectrum group for three years, um, one of the things I kept seeing was that so many people were interested in creating these doula groups, uh, but they didn't have the resources, they didn't have ideas about infrastructure, they didn't have training plans, and they definitely just didn't have communities that supported them in that work. Um, each group would reinvent the wheel, only to find out that um, later in the process that there were people sort of right next door that could have helped them. Um, and so these were all problems that the Bay Area Doula Project had been having too. And what we needed was a way to connect to one another, regionally and nationally, um, so that we could learn from one another and build community and really build a presence within the re reproductive justice movement. Um, so I knew that a number of full spectrum groups existed around the country. Many of them were connected to the Area Doula Project through various social media, which made it easy for me to find them, but not necessarily easy for them to find each other. Um, so I sent out a survey to everyone I knew and asked them to send it to everyone they knew. Um, just to see if there was any interest in this formation of this national network of full spectrum doula groups. And I told them that it would be a platform where we could share resources, it would be easily accessible, there would be opportunities for us to learn from one another and build community with one another and better serve our clients. And the list was sort of endless, like, it'll do this, it'll do this, it'll do this. Um, and then the ultimate question was, does anyone want to do this with me? And the response to that question was a very resounding yes. Um, so we've begun the work. Um, so there's been nine groups in eight states around the country, um, and we've been working together to build this network. 
Um, we have conference calls monthly, and we have an email listserv, and we're working right now to build this website um, so that people that are interested in joining dual groups can find out where they might be, um, so that new groups can get tips on how to start, and um, most importantly, I think, so that there's visual representation of us in the movement and in the world. Um, and what we found so far is that really our connectivity is really fostering not only productivity, but creativity. Um, together, we're coming up with really creative solutions to meet the needs of the folks that we serve and to really address the organizational gaps that we see. Um, and what we each have found in this work that's really centered on supporting each other is that it feels really good to be supported by one another. Um, so when I think back on how I got here, um, I think you know, not being able to talk about or make space for bodies and sex and pregnancy in my, house, in my house, excuse me, felt really hard. Um, but learning how to talk about it and um, learning how to support others in their sexual and reproductive experiences, that felt scary but also exciting. Um, and through the Core Life Fellowship, when we delved into our leadership styles, I found out that one of my actual strengths is that I make the exciting safe. Um, and that to me, that just sort of blew open my world because it reaffirmed for me exactly why I gravitate toward this work. Um, it isn't just that I do this work because I myself need safe, compassionate spaces, but because I'm actually good at creating them for myself and for others, at fostering this emotional connectivity, and there's leadership value in that. Um, so this feels like a really good place for me to be now. Um, and while it still feels really hard to invest in a project in which I have so much at stake, it also feels like a good sign. I should have real skin in the game. Um, it keeps me driven, it keeps me focused, it keeps me passionate. Um, it forces me to take risks instead of just always encouraging others to do so. Um, and as we all take really big leaps forward into the unknown, I'm really glad to know that none of us will have to do it alone.
So how would you leave tomorrow? My flight leaves around like ten. Oh, yeah. oh hi, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> She's stuck in the bag. <laughs> yep. Sorry, I had a conference call that I had rescheduled twice already Ooh. at <laughs> six, and I was like, I cannot reschedule the third time. No worries. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Finish by the look. Right? Yeah, I think socks. Socks really nail this outfit. It really ties it all together. Blue socks. Everyone loves that blue. Mm-hmm. Just have a couple of that. And they're really matching socks about it. Those are your Argyle ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a good one. Yeah, you don't have to start right now. Okay. Every day, I wake up to an empty house. I'm single. I'm child free. I make breakfast for one. I work every day from my dining room table, sitting across from no one. There have been times where I've gone days without hearing another human voice, except for through the speaker. I am a reproductive justice organizer in Oklahoma. I am a tiny blue dot drowning in a sea of red. I spend much of my time feeling totally and utterly alone. Many people wonder why I do the work I do in the place that I do it. And to be honest, sometimes I really do too. (laughs) Not only is Oklahoma one of the states with the highest amount of abortion-related restrictions, it's also the place where we incarcerate women at a higher rate than anywhere in the world. It's also a place that is ravaged by generations of trauma. Violence against Native people and other people of color didn't stop with the Trail of Tears, the Tulsa Race Riot, or the Indian boarding schools. Native people, people of color, and undocumented people live in fear of being separated from their families on a daily basis by violence and by the state. (coughs) Queer kids live in fear of violence and rejection from their communities, their peers, and even their own families. It is a hard place to live. But it is that toughness that ultimately brings me home again and again. I focus on what it takes to do reproductive justice work (coughs) in the most conservative climates, where the need is great and the resources are few. I advocate for elevating the voices of those who choose to stay and fight for their home. I push back against assumptions about my neighbors, my friends, and even my political enemies. And I'm hungry for a new way of working in this movement that is adaptable to hostile political climates, but still centers the voices of the most marginalized. So when I was given this opportunity to become a generative fellow at Coraline, I was excited, but definitely apprehensive. I've been thought of as a leader in my region and the organizations I work in and the projects I've worked on, but this is the first time I was really breaking out on my own. And to me, that was so terrifying. (laughs) It felt much safer to say, I'm over here with them, than to say, I'm me, I'm Sandra, here's my ideas, naked and transparent. I really didn't know what I wanted to do with this opportunity, and so the idea was floated to me to do a Red State toolkit, organizer toolkit. And to be honest, um, I've never actually used a toolkit, um, which probably should have been a major red flag. (laughs) But I kind of chalked it up to the idea that, you know, nothing had really spoken to me of the toolkits I had seen. Nothing had spoken to my situation. So I floated it by some other red state organizers, and they were super excited. And so I was like, I'm going to get excited, too. This is obviously something people want, people need. And since my identity is so wrapped up in red stateness, why not? So I began interviewing folks to get a sense of their paths, um, what their successes were, what their failures were, what they wanted, what they needed, what they didn't need. 
and the environmental factors that allowed them to thrive in such hostile circumstances. This was by far the most fun part of the project, <laughs> um, getting to talk to people. I was able to pair some of the traveling I was doing for regional organizing consulting with um, being able to do interviews actually in person, which in my part of the country is such a huge deal because basically everyone is seems to be three hours apart from each other, give or take a little bit of time. So <coughs> we were able to get together, interacting with each other beyond this kind of virtual foundation that we've built ourselves on through email, Twitter, Facebook, Google Hangout, and really um, deepen our connections in, in what was really like some very profound experiences. And it kept me excited about the project until I wasn't excited anymore. Um, as I was interviewing people, they were incredibly enthusiastic about the idea of a toolkit. But as I reviewed my notes, um, I realized that that was not really coming across in what they were saying. Um, people were saying, I need funding, I, need, I want money, and I, I don't know where to get it. I need skill building. I want to spend time with other organizers. I want to do what you and I are doing right here, right now, in this moment. They weren't actually saying, I need a map to tell me how to do organizing. They were telling me, I want the tools the actual tools that I can't give to them on a piece of paper. All these ideas were great, but none of them were toolkits. But I just kept going. Uh, I said I was going to do this, and I'm going to do it. And I kept generating drafts, and I hated every single one of them. I fought against every instinct that told me that this idea had no soul. This idea wasn't me. I spiraled for a little while. There was a lot of self-loathing. Why did I pick this project? I'm a fraud. People thought I could do this, and I realized that I never for a second really thought, really believed, that I was going to follow through and make this happen. And I was terrified that people were going to figure that out, that I was faking it the whole time. I was in the dark place. Not only did I feel like a fraud, I also felt more alone than I had ever felt. I felt like no one had my back. I thought about not just quitting my project, but quitting the whole movement. What business, what, what business did I have doing this work if I couldn't do something as simple and straightforward as a toolkit? I finally reached out to a friend and let him know how low I had gotten. I told them I'm not wanting to leave the movement. I was worried that I didn't have anything but my work if I did leave. He said, Sandra, you have a lot of things to offer. You listed many great qualities and different skill sets, and you're a great person, all these wonderful things about me, blah, 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 blah. But I was just not willing to hear that. So he finally said, you really like cooking. Why don't you just do that for a while? So I did. And I decided to put everything away and only do the bare minimum that my consulting jobs required of me. And I put everything else, reproductive justice, related on hold and just cooked nonstop for two weeks. Elaborate three-course meals, insomnia quiches. <laughs> I even delved into baking, which I had previously avoided because I was so turned off by the precision that it required. I was taught to cook by my Filipino grandmother, which meant eyeing everything, never measuring, and just kind of enjoying the unpredictability and the spontaneity of your results. But suddenly the precision of baking became incredibly enticing in my really inner chaotic world at the time. In the past, I've often found myself drawn to recipes that were exciting and required learning a new skill or technique. But I would always bookmark them and save them for later. So I began challenging myself just to do that roux, make that bechamel, like, just don't be perfect, but put, put, put push myself. And eventually something opened up in me. I realized that I was more than just the outcome of this project or a product of the movement. I was capable of creation of something tangible and not just something theoretical. 
something that physically nourished me and my loved ones. I finally decided to pick up my project again and to go through my research. At that, much, at that point, I, I had pretty much accepted that a toolkit was not going to happen. <laughs> um, but I had to salvage something from this experience. I mean, I loved talking with all these people. There had to be something there. And I, so I went back through my notes, and I kept identifying the same patterns over and over again. I want space. I want a space that's ours. I want to see you face to face. I want to learn from each other. I want that spontaneity that happens when you get a bunch of really awesome, amazing, brilliant people in the room together and just see what happens. And then I have my lip bulb moment. At heart, I am a pattern identifier. I want to know how people work, why they think the way that they do, what their motivations are. It's something that I don't even do consciously. I already knew what the patterns were, but I was ignoring them because they didn't fit my project. The empathy piece was so important, and it's one of my greatest strengths, but I kept putting it away. My light bulb moment was that I, when I realized that I wanted to create a space for face-to-face -face human contact. I wanted to lessen the burden of isolation. I wanted people to share their successes, their failures, their skills, their desires with each other and to come up with solutions together. I am meant to organize convening for these hungry red state organizers. I feel like this is the project that I always dreamed of doing but can never articulate. Bringing together people is something I've always loved, whether it's an elaborate dinner party or it's a community meeting. I have already organized a conference in Oklahoma around red state organizing that has become very large and successful, but it lacks the intimacy and the ability to dig deeper that we're really hungry for. And so, of course, this is my path. This is something that drives me. This is what wakes me up in the morning. It makes me feel passionate, and I just can't feel passionate about toolkits. <laughs> Maybe somebody should, but that someone is not me. I was trying to do what I thought I needed to do, to do the work that I thought needed to be done, to be the organizer I thought I needed to be, instead of just being the organizer that I am and playing to my own strengths. I thought by doing something completely different from anything I'd ever done that I was being innovative. I thought I needed to change my work and who I am to be in better service to the movement. But I don't need to change who I am. I needed to be who I am. I needed to be myself in order to change the movement. Because being me means opening up paths for people to do the other work that needs to be done in ways that I am not built to do. I don't have to be everything to everyone. I can just be me, and that's more than just adequate. It's revolutionary. Yeah. I just watched you do those like the feet, the forensic feet. So we we found out today that we don't to debate, but you do this thing where you like when you're when you're speaking, you have a stance, and then when you're not speaking, you have a stance. Okay. And I watched her go from this to like, and I was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> she's so good. Yeah, yeah. You're so good at it. Because thinking about Goldie Hawn and first wife's club, <laughs> <laughs> you were giving Goldie Hawn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's the best feedback I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah, that was great. Awesome. You guys, I have to go now, but that was really...
question. That was so cool seeing, especially you and Poonam, since we've just been on this long journey. It was so amazing to watch. <laughs> really cool. Really cool. Thanks for arranging this, you guys. This was really awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Yeah, great job, Sarah. Everything worked out. Seriously. Yeah. 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 Yeah.